part of the games business is games and what part is business and how do you deal with that? Oh man, that's a tough question. Uh, uh, I only ask the tough questions, man. <laughs> um, well, actually, <laughs> making games is the part that I wanted to do the most, but, uh, but uh, being a businessman is, is really the difference between success and just creating a game. Uh, it is extremely important. Uh, I spend much more of my time, especially now, I do business only almost, uh, very little development anymore. Uh, so it is it's vital to, uh, to make sure that you are a businessman first and really, because without it you won't have success and you want to keep going, you want to keep making more games and you have to be a businessman in order for that to uh, come true. You said that you, you were doing games since high school, right? Yeah, right. I taught myself to program uh, when I was about 11 years old on an Apple II Plus and, uh, and uh, started making games uh, almost right away, uh, practicing, but came up with Diablo uh, when I was in high school. Uh, we, were, we were discussing that he said that he was an overnight sensation with Diablo, but he <laughs> said that he had seven games published before he did Diablo. That's right. And, 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 and were they lousy? Were they failures? What happened? Uh, I, I don't know if they were lousy. But <laughs> the first one was pretty lousy, but the uh, but you know I got better and better at making games. Actually, it was my first PC game, and actually the very first game I ever wrote in C instead of assembly. And um, but it, it took a lot of practice to get to Diablo. Uh, well, were you already thinking about the action role-playing games? Uh, no. genre at the time, or, or how, how did you, uh, you're considered basically the inventor of uh, ARPGs, so uh, tell me a little about uh, how, how you stumbled into this, this, this well, genre. Yeah, it was, at the time, uh, publishers and businessmen uh, said RPGs are dead, nobody, we're not making any more, we're not making any money on them, uh, so I, I was pitching Diablo to publishers to get funding for the project and I got rejected more than 25 times for Diablo uh, before finally I found somebody that, uh, that, would, that would publish it. Um, and so we got funding, it was a kind of a, a publishing developer deal where they get a majority of the revenue because they're giving us money to make the product and then about ha halfway through that process of, of doing that uh, we got acquired by them and became Blizzard North. Uh, so it was Blizzard Entertainment that was that was funding it. Um, so uh, it was really difficult to get an RPG made at the time. Uh, and but we wanted to do something very different, and and people couldn't understand the difference between what we were trying to offer and what was the, you know a traditional traditional role-playing game. A lot of the role-playing games were very slow, they were turn-based, they um, had lots of, you, you had to press lots and lots of keys to attack something, it was like, yeah, there are seven steps, I gotta draw out my sword and I have to, you know, get into the ready position and then I have to select which guy I'm gonna swing and then I have to target it and then, and then, oh, he's gonna attack so I gotta block and things like that and we're like, why don't you just click on it? <laughs> And that would be a lot more fun. So, uh, yeah, actually, Diablo was turn-based when when we started. And one day, uh, there was a debate in the office about trying to make it real time or not, uh, because we had done similar things with uh, with strategy games that just turned into real time strategies instead of turn-based strategies. So we want to do the same thing here. And there's a big debate, uh, and. I thought it was going to take a long time to change it from turn-based to real-time, uh, but I coded it up in an afternoon. <laughs> and the very first time that I actually clicked on a skeleton, there was a skeleton, I was a warrior, and you walked over there and smacked it. It was like, I knew that something special had <laughs> just happened. I could, it was like the, the rays of light came down from the heavens and the angels sang and it was it was it was an amazing experience I knew right away that I was like oh my god this, this is this is something very different and uh, quickly knew that that was the right answer and a different direction we were going to go with it so uh, it, it was it was challenging and it was a lot of luck almost that we stumbled across it
uh, you, you just, uh, 25 no's before yes. Uh, yeah, it, it, so this is, it, it takes persistence. Uh, something that we, we hear a lot here, uh, sometimes developers say, ah, nobody understands my game, or nobody wants to you know, invest on my game. And in Brazil it's tougher too because the interest rate is so high, people can just put their money on the bank and make money that they don't have to invest in games, of course. Uh, but uh, this, is, uh, this is something that emerging markets in Brazil is very different from the US. Uh, just about funding. Uh, you're a Brazilian developer, okay? You're a young Brazilian developer. You have no access to funding like you have in the U.S. What do you do? Uh, well, there's a lot of solutions out there, but, uh, you know, back then, back when I started, we didn't, uh, we, we actually worked on some games without funding to get to demos and things like that. And so if you have a proof of concept, it makes, makes it much easier. Uh, but also, you know, when I was young, I can't really do this anymore. I have got a big family, so, uh, but, you know, when I was in my 20s, I, I was, it was okay with not making all that much money, and it was more about I really want, had the passion to make these games, and so I was working really hard for not very much money and kind of struggling along to see my games get made. And uh, so once you do that, there's lots of options after that for distribution more options now than ever before. Uh, that's, it's, we're in a really lucky time actually that you can get creative and anybody can make a game anywhere in the world and distribute it anywhere in the world. And it, it, it's a much different than it was even 10 years ago. Uh, when I first, my very first time that I ever made a game, I, I made it and the only distribution I had was the local game store. This is when I was still very young and I, made it and I burnt the discs and I m m put it in a little baggie and I went down to the store. I didn't sell one copy uh, and uh, that now to be able to reach millions of people, uh, it's, it's amazing uh, that you can do that from anywhere now. So trying to get your own funding is still very difficult. There are not a whole bunch of options. You have to go with uh, investment from either uh, at shows, you can meet people uh, uh, or publishers, uh, but those are, those are I suggest trying to go at it on your own and do distribution through uh, whatever networks, Apple or, or Steam or whatever. You have a long career and unfortunately we can't discuss your uh, Diablo, and Diablo 2 and Hellgate London uh, in depth, but uh, so I'll just try to focus a bit on your current project, Marvel Heroes, now yeah. Marvel Heroes 2015. Uh, you went from uh, Diablo to Hellgate, and Hellgate was pretty dark, and, and, and yeah. <laughs> right? And uh, so how, how do you go from something like Hellgate London to something so broad and, and something that has to uh, appeal to all ages and like Marvel heroes? Uh, what, what was the learning process there? Uh, there? There wasn't a whole bunch of learning. It was more that it, my passion for the Marvel IP. I'm a big comic reader, I have been for a very long time, I love Marvel, and so this was an opportunity to say, oh, I, I want to make Diablo when you play as the Marvel superheroes. So that, that was really the premise behind the game, and, uh, and it was just mainly my own passion for, for that IP and, and the opportunity uh, it was granted that I was able to do this, uh, I was very lucky. I understand that uh, you were under a lot of pressure to release the first version of Marvel Heroes from investors and all that. And when the game came out, uh, many people didn't like it. It had a bad, uh, bad reviews. It, you had a 58 on uh, Metacritic. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you say, wow, what, everybody was waiting for, like, Diablo goes Marvel, right? <laughs> and uh, so, uh, how do you deal with that? So, you, you put all this effort, to make uh, something that you love about superheroes that you love, uh, and people don't like it, you get a bad, uh, bad uh, reviews. How did you uh, uh, dealt with that, and how did you fix it? Because you did fix it, and uh, right now, uh, uh, Marvel Heroes 2015 is much, much bigger and has a much, much better, uh, uh, much better reviews, and people really enjoy it. How how do you go from a uh, I wouldn't say a failure, but how do you go from underperforming and how do you fix a game? 
That's a great question. Um, and it's not easy. <laughs> uh, and it really, it came down to, uh, the important part was engaging our audience, our community, the people that are there that are playing the game, that like the game, and being open and honest with them and admitting that it wasn't the game that we wanted either. Uh, we just spent three and a half years of our lives to come out with this. This is no, this is no good. We spent a lot of money making this game and we're, we're really upset about it. We, un we understand there are problems and we're gonna fix them. Uh, and so I opened up the forums, uh, the, the message boards that people can talk to the community with, with everybody the entire company. So no matter what position you were in, you could be the CFO or you can be in QA or whatever, you're allowed to talk with the community and talk about what's going on. And we were very open and honest about our communication. Hey, this is broken and we're gonna fix it. And then we started patching and fixing the game every week. And so there was updates, updates, and we're gonna fix this 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 week. And then it would come out and be fixed. And people are like, oh, that's, that's a nice improvement. We're gonna add this to the, and it's gonna be in about two months, we're gonna have this new feature. And sure enough, it came along. And one of the very first things that we did is we changed the way that you got heroes. Uh, instead of making them random drops, instead we made it that you can uh, earn the hero through play. And that was a really positive change. And it took us about three weeks to do it. And, uh, and then the audience started believing, hey, these guys are really working on it. We're gonna stick around. We're gonna, we're gonna see this through. We're really happy with the progress they're making. And then it gets better and better over time. We, we knew what the problems were with the game. I mean, I think developers do when you release something and it's not done yet. And uh, you can see the faults yourself. So when we had plans, we knew what we wanted to do with the game. We just didn't have the time or the money to, to do that. So we had, uh, you know, the investors gave us some money to make sure that we could get somewhere. We had to unfortunately reduce the staff a little bit, uh, but we were able to continue and work on it and then iterate and make it better week after week after week after week. And, uh, and then just never stopped. <laughs> you have to stick with, with your work, right? You can't yeah. just go jumping from project to project. Right. Questions. Who have questions for David Brevik? I have a lot of questions here, but if you want to do the first one. Oh, that was the first guy. Yeah. Faz a pergunta. Here. I got headphones just a second. With, uh, with all the situation with, uh, between Marvel, use like the movies, the movies and uh, the X Men and all the different IPs and the way that they're dealing with the comics, were there any restrictions or liberties that they gave you to select the heroes and the way that they get into the game? No, uh, we have a very unusual contract uh, with Marvel, and it's one of the reasons I wanted to do this game. Uh, was because of the opportunity that it presented. There are no real restrictions on the characters that we can use. And so Marvel has been very open about allowing us to choose whomever we wanted. Uh, they also help us though in that they give us a lot of information ahead of time. Oh, in, for instance, they said, all right, when, you, when this game comes out, uh, you guys want to make sure that you have Rocket Raccoon in the game. And I said, Rocket Raccoon? All right, now, I love Rocket Raccoon and I love Guardians of the Galaxy, but come on, nobody knows this guy. Why, you know, trust me, you want Rocket in the game. So, uh, you, you, you play as Rocket sometimes, right? I play Rocket a lot. <laughs> uh, and uh, so th they, you know, they help us out uh, in saying, oh, you know, Vision's gonna be in Avengers 2, and so, we knew a year ahead of time, that way we, we can plan out uh, and synchronize with events that they have, not just in the movies, but also in the comics. Next question. You. Você. Fala aí, meu. Hi. Um, one of the things that I really like about Diablo is uh, how unique the art style goes as far as not only the, the, the visual part, but the music is really amazing. Yeah. Uh, was that already planned on, on the decision process on, on, on making the game from start, or yeah. did it just come along? Yeah, that was another thing that we want to make different about the game, uh, was the art style. A lot of the games that were out at the time, 
were, you know, elves and fairies and things like that. And we're like, we just want blood and guts, so we're gonna <laughs> make it really dark. And uh, it was funny, the, the owner of, of Blizzard at the time uh, was this, this company called Davidson and Associates, and they made educational games like Reading Blaster and Math Blaster and things like that. And uh, Jan Davidson, who she uh, was one of the owners of this company, and she was this older woman, she was in her 60s, and the first time she saw Diablo, she said, oh, I don't know about this. <laughs> I don't know if we want to go down this path. And I'm like, trust us, <laughs> this is going to sell. And uh, we just didn't want to go with the kind of happy, fun land. We wanted to go with kind of a dark, gothic feel to it. Uh, but the music uh, was really, it was all Matt Ullman, uh, which was a very lucky hire for us. Uh, and uh, he was a superb musician. And uh, he, um, and uh, a little known fact, his father was one of the lawyers in the OJ case. Uh, anyway, uh, his, uh, he, uh, he was just, just did a brilliant job on the music, and, uh, and it really added to the entire atmosphere. So it all came together, and we were very fortunate. Okay, you guys... Oh, hello. Hello. Uh, I was reading something about uh, Marvel Heroes. I didn't play the game myself, but I'm willing to try. Uh, it's difficult, too. I, I think a lot of guys here will, will uh, think, like me, that we don't have a lot of time to play MMORPGs anymore, right. but uh, it's cool. And, and something really unique uh, to Marvel Heroes that uh, shows some difference from the DC Universe, uh, for example, is the fact that you can use uh, the real heroes, like Wolverine and Deadpool right. and Hulk and Thor. And uh, at first I was like, uh, I don't know, I, I don't know if I would uh, feel the same if I saw another tour or like 30 tours <laughs> right. running around in a quest or a raid, but then it struck me that the, we really want to, to play with uh, uh, the heroes that we love and not creating some generic heroes. But uh, when, when did the, 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 this, uh, this thing came out? Uh, how were, were the, the process to say uh, this is a like an MMORPG, but we're not allowing them to create their superheroes. Uh, they're using uh, their stock, Marvel, and uh, how do you think that people relate with that in the game? And, and, and completing that question too, uh, one thing that I was curious about, uh, how difficult was... Thank you. How difficult was uh, uh, dealing with the variety of powers, because you don't have classes, right? It's just, it's completely different. You have each different character, some of them, many of them fly, many of them are strong, but they have different, uh, completely different uh, uh, power sets. So how difficult was that? Uh, well, the, the process, first I'll answer the part A here. Uh, the, the, we made the decision to play as the Marvel superheroes right from the very beginning, uh, for the exact reasons that you're saying. I didn't want to play next to uh, the Herc instead of the Hulk and, uh, and I wanted to play as the actual heroes I know and love, and the story is much more interesting when you're doing that. And there's uh, a lot of costumes and history and relationships with the different characters and between the different characters. You can't capture that and you lose all of that, which is really the, the meat of the IP, and so it was really important to me. That said, it was an MMO, and so people are like, that's weird. You can play, there's seven Spider-Mans on the screen. I'm like, yep. They're like, that's weird. I said, yep, but it's awesome. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, when you're playing, you, it, it's not that big of a deal. Because even in an MMO, uh, in an MMORPG, you, you're, you see, oh, it's 14 other wood elves here with me. Uh, they look this, they have the same stupid hat on that I do. And, uh, and you know, th that's okay. I am whom, who I am right now, and, that, and I'm focused on me as the character, is in the, the character is in the center of the screen. And even then, I have a different costume on, or somebody else has a different costume. Uh, and so that, that process was something that we wanted to really, you know, made us kind of unique and different uh, from other games. 
Uh, and we're a very different MMORPG than most MMOs. Most, when people say MMORPG, they think of World of Warcraft, and oh my god, it's going to take me 12 hours to walk across this land. And I get, it's nothing like that. i got to do 47 kill wolf quests. And uh, it's nothing like that. It, it, it's like Diablo. It, it looks and plays like Diablo. It's just thousands of people in the world at the same time. So it, it, it's, it's very different than in most MMORPGs. As for the, uh, the actual powers, it is something that is a big challenge. Basically, we have 40, I think, 8 now characters in the game that you can play as. Uh, so it's like having 48 different character classes. And uh, we, we make a new character every month. Uh, and and uh, the, this month was Doctor Doom was the, the character you could play as. Um, he came out a few weeks ago. And so every time we do something different, that every single one of them plays differently than a different one. Uh, and it's a, it's a big process. We have quite a few people working on it, uh, a pipeline, setting up the powers, doing the visual effects, doing the balance, doing all that, you know, design. A lot of the people that are involved are big Marvel fans, so they know a lot of the history and et cetera with the, with the heroes, what costumes will come out with it and things like that. We plan this months and months in advance. And, uh, and kind of get ahead of the game and have several that are, that are ready, you know, at any given time. Okay. Next. Next. There. Oh, there. Seu próximo. Você já fez uma, daí você faz de novo daqui a pouco. Okay, uh, my question is, uh, Diablo these days have won the Spirit of Success for, you know, I don't know, you see, uh, Path of, Z of Z. I'm sorry? Como é que é? Diablo have won the... Tem um sucessor espiritual. Ah, o sucessor. O okay. Path of Z, que saiu na Steam. Eu gostaria que o David fizesse uma crítica sobre o Path of Z. O que ele acha do sucessor espiritual? Ok, the spiritual successor. Marvel Heroes is the spiritual successor to, to Diablo 2? Uh, it sort of is, but... I would like to eventually get back to making a fantasy kind of action RPG. I think that that will happen in the future. Do, do, you, do you think you ever uh, get to do Diablo 4? No. No. Okay. I mean, I could go back to Blizzard, uh, but Blizzard doesn't want to be up in San Francisco, and I'm not leaving San Francisco, so... <laughs> That's a good reason. Very good reason. Why should you go out of San Francisco? Uh, can you... Tem alguma aqui? Se não, eu tenho uma pergunta aqui. Você tem uma ali? Manda. Como? Ah, oh, why, why free to play? Free to play, yeah. Uh, well, games, games as a service, which is what Marvel Heroes 2015 is, is, it, you know, it's constantly going on, constantly being updated, new modes, new features, new heroes, all sorts of stuff. And there are really, there are, two or three different business models that you can choose from. Uh, one is subscription, but subscription has failed over and over and over and over again. There's been one big success with subscription, which was a monster success. Uh, and, and so we, don't need, we didn't want to compete in that way. Uh, two is that you can make a box and sell it and let everybody play for free and give the updates for free and then sell boxes every few years. Uh, but that is that's a riskier thing to do. Uh, there, it, the potential to make money there in that situation is not as not as good. Um, then we want to do free to play. And free to play really is kind of an emerging uh, business model that is worldwide friendly. Uh, you can go into Asia. You can go a anywhere in the world. That free to play is really becoming very popular, and uh, we knew this was going to happen. Uh, so we designed it to be free to play from the beginning, and uh, and so I think that it gives everybody the opportunity to play the game, uh, and and we still have a good source of revenue. The people that want to pay can, uh, and we don't really require you to pay. Uh, in Marvel Heroes, you can go ahead and play the entire thing for free. In fact, about 85 percent of the people do. Uh, and so, uh, and that's fine. And uh, so, it, I think there are just a few options when you're doing this kind of game, and uh, this was the one that made the most sense for us. 
David, about free to play, <clears throat> there are many players that feel that uh, uh, free to play changes uh, the, the playability of a game. That you, you yeah. make some some stuff uh, difficult on purpose, yeah. and uh, it's it sometimes it doesn't flow so naturally. Yeah. Uh, it's a different uh, game experience uh, because you need this this obstacle so people will you know. Uh, uh, do more and, and, make, and make payments and all that. Uh, how do you feel about that? No, I think it's true. I think that uh, free to play, it can be abused like any other business model. Uh, and it depends on how generous you want to be. You can make it uh, demanding to, to pay or you can make it be very generous. My philosophy is to be as generous as possible because I feel if you're generous to other people, they'll be generous to you. And uh, so far, it's proven to work. <laughs> we have very high metrics, so uh, uh, it's, it's really been very successful for us. Como que é o regime de trabalho da sua equipe? Eles têm um horário fixo, uma produção com um deadline apertado, ou eles têm um horário livre? Como que funciona? <laughs> yeah, um, we do uh, work under pressure. I think that uh, it, that's one of the things with a live game that you're constantly updating is there's always pressure because. Uh, there are going to be bugs. There are going to be things that you need, deadlines you need to hit. Oh, for instance, we have to have this hero and all these costumes ready for the Avengers because the movie date isn't moving. We can't just slip past that. We have to capture that opportunity. So we have to have deadlines that we have to meet. Um, and uh, so there is some pressure, but we also, we, we manage our time well. Uh, since this is a marathon and not a sprint, you can't burn people out and work them super hard all the time. You have to, you have to kind of have small periods maybe where you need to work hard and then try and keep everybody's workflow uh, level. We, we do a, a system of development in where we estimate how much time every task is going to take and then, then plan that many uh, hours for different people uh, and so then we have, you know, then we can get a big picture of what, when things will be available and we aren't burning everybody out. Agora ali. I'm Pedro, I work at the Game for Change Brazilian chapter and uh, as a storyteller with the, all, all the, like, not only history but like storytelling related issues, how, what is the, the process that you use to not only choose which storylines to put in game, but how do you place them, for example, on a map, or do you take like to sit on a single meeting and you say let's use axes and make like one map, or do you, or, and how do you place them inside the map, like physically, how do you spread all the missions? Uh, so for Marvel Heroes, uh, we, we had a famous writer do our main story, is Brian Michael Bendis, who's a comic book writer, he's written lots of Marvel comics. And he wrote the main storyline uh, that we built the game around uh, that kind of ties together with a series of little comics and stuff. Uh, then after that, after the main storyline was done, then we have gone on and, and we have some team members that that is some of their, in fact, mainly their job is to write different sections of the game. Uh, and in fact, one of them actually worked at Marvel, so he <laughs> knows the Marvel Universe really, really well. And, uh, and so they're responsible for writing the stories. When it comes time to decide what we're going to do, we do get together as a group and, we, and I make the decision in the end, hey, this is the way we're going to go. Though usually we're all on the same page about what we want to do. It's not really a tough decision. Uh, and a lot of times we'll focus on, hey, there's some Marvel comic event or a movie event or something like that that we want to tie into. For instance, the Axis uh, comic event in the winter was, oh, we wanted, we knew about that in advance, we wanted to kind of tie into that, so we have these side stories that we call one-shots uh, that are 
from a menu that you can just select where you want to go and experience that one little bite of story. Uh, so you can experience the entire main story or you can do these little side stories through a menu. Próxima, você. Depois você. Hi, David. Uh, I would Hi. like to know if you can talk about your earlier projects before sure. Diablo and uh, the ones you failed. And um, if you can talk about the technical difficulties you had, the personal, the psychological difficulties you had doing those games, those early games. Right. So the early games, I don't know if they were really, I mean, they weren't big hits, uh, but I wouldn't, we didn't really fail from technical issues. Uh, the, the very first game I made or was working on is a game called Gordo 106 that was for the Atari Lynx which is a handheld kind of Game Boy uh, device for by Atari. Uh, and the reason that project failed is because my paychecks were bouncing and I, I, could, I wasn't getting paid, so I left. Uh, but that was really the only, the only technical one that didn't work. Uh, after that, then I went to a company called, and was the technical director at a company called Iguana, uh, entertainment and uh, I the very first game I made was super high impact football which is an American football game uh, kind of like NBA Jam but for American American football uh, and it was before NBA Jam and in fact then I eventually worked on NBA Jam uh, the first console games um, and at Iguana and uh, also I worked on a, a platformer called Arrow the Acrobat and a game called Pirates of the Dark Water and, uh, and some other games like that. And they were, um, they, I just learned how to make games, you know, you, you have kind of an idea of how to make a game, but the important part is actually finishing the game, and the actual finishing of a game, you just learn so much. 90% uh, of the work is the last 10% of the game. And, uh, and so uh, just keep that in mind that finishing is the important part and, uh, and you will learn more in that last 10% than you will at any other time. This is something that perhaps you can advise people uh, here in Brazil. Uh, sometimes I see uh, people with projects that are very complicated, very expensive, very hard to do. It will take a lot of people, a lot of money. And uh, we were talking about this uh, uh, earlier. Uh, isn't it wiser to just uh, make more games, yes. but simpler games where you can fail and learn? How did it, that work for you? How, how, what, what's the best way to accomplish that? Yeah, that, I think that's very true. I mean, when you're starting to make games, it's important to make as many games as you possibly can. <laughs> uh, so, and work, having, in, work in different genres too, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, explore a little bit, make a bunch of different games, because each one will teach you something. Making one giant project that is the end-all be-all as your first product is, is extremely difficult. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I suggest that you try and, you know, save that great idea, the big idea for a time when you've uh, established yourself, made a few games. You know, once you've made a few games, it's a lot easier to get funding. And you can make a bigger project and you can have your dream project and you can get make sure that it will have a chance to be successful uh, as opposed to putting all of your effort into, it, into something uh, right off the bat. It's a lot better to get a few games under your belt and, and learn from that. Okay. Sim? Ele tem uma pergunta, não? É. Você levantou a mão, certo? Yeah, um, I have a question about balance issues. Mm -hmm. So, there's a bunch of philosophies about that. And there's Bob one who listen to you, but don't answer anything and launch a, a patch. And there's Blizzard, hear, hear what you're talking about, but don't mind too much. And there's Square Enix, who hears what you're talking, says, hey, my game is shit. And I blow out my MMO and start from point zero, like Final Fantasy XIV. Right. So, well, if you're, if you're making a, Community driven game. How do you deal with how do you deal with those whining? Because <laughs> you, you have to do something. Because yeah. if you don't do, there will be lots and lots of discussion, discussions about your game, and it will just break it. So, so what to do? Uh, that's a good question. 
The answer is pretty much give the community what they want. So you're making a game, I mean, you're making it for yourself, but you're also making it for other people that are playing it. And if there are balance issues, give them a whole bunch of things that they're asking for and they, they, they want. Listen to your audience. They're paying you money, so you want to make sure that, <laughs> that you are, you know, that you are listening. Oh, you can't be all high and mighty about whatever it is that you feel is, this is, this is my point in my game. Uh, you have to try and look at it from other people's perspective and whether or not it is fun or fair or whatever. If you build up that goodwill and give them a lot of things that you want, sometimes you have to make tough choices that are for the betterment of the game and you then have a lot of credit built up with the community that you can say, oh, we're going to have to do this. We know it's not going to be popular. This is why we're doing it. Be straight, be honest with them. Then they'll say, okay, that sucks, but we understand. Plus, you've given us all this great stuff, and you do all these nice things for us, so you know, we're going to let that slide, and we're not going to be really angry about it. So I think building up that goodwill and then trying not to spend that very often is, is important. It's better to not necessarily nerf things. It's much better to make sure that you are you know, raising a lot of stuff and nerfing very few things That's in general. I think that people get most upset when there's something out there that um, that they feel that they're enjoying and doing and loving and it's some, they feel like they're cheating or abusing uh, because there's maybe some imbalances, most of the time it's better to raise things up uh, than it is to, to smack things down. I think that's uh, it's true in life uh, uh, in general, right? You have to make yourself happy and have to make your employer or your, your, your team yeah. or your audience happy too. You can't have just one, right? right. Otherwise you go crazy. I think we're, we're almost finished. Our time is almost finished now. We have a few minutes, five minutes? Okay, okay. so we have one, one more there. Okay, uh, quick questions please. So um, the basic gameplay of the action RPG games has been basically the same since the dawn of era in the 90s. So do you think that the genre can be developed further than what we see right now, like Path of Exile and Diablo 3 and Green Dawn? Do you all have the same basic, basic gameplay from Diablo 1? Do you think that it can be de developed further? Yeah, sure. I mean, there. it depends. I mean. Hellgate was an action RPG, or at least I consider it to be, and that was very different than Diablo. I think Borderlands is also an action RPG that's very different. So uh, I think that it doesn't have to be restricted to just the way that Diablo is made. Uh, I, I think that it's easiest when we had tight deadlines for making Marvel that we had to make decisions about making sure that we were doing something that we were familiar with and not experimenting as much because we just had, you know, time and money constraints. And so, uh, and even then we didn't really <laughs> succeed in, in meeting those deadlines. So, um, you know, I think that uh, it, it's a, it, there's lots of room to grow and, they, and just like in shooters, they're very similar to the very first, you know, Wolfenstein, <laughs> you know, and that they, they've emerged, they've, they've grown up a bit and the graphics are much nicer, but the action and the, and the, the play is pretty much the same. Yeah. Final question. Sorry. Yeah, you do. What was your source of inspiration for Diablo? Uh, there was a series of games that I played uh, when I was in college. Uh, I actually thought of the, the name Diablo and the game idea for it when I was in high school, but in college I was really influenced by a series of games that are, that are rogue-like games, including Rogue and Moria and Angban and NetHack and things like that. And that. Those were the games that I was playing on these Unix machines in the computer lab that were big influences on the Diablo design. What did you study in college, actually? I, didn't I was a computer science major. Computer science major. Okay, now, um, uh, final question, my, my final question. Okay, let's jump, let's travel uh, in sure. time, okay? <laughs> and now it's, uh, it's five years from now, mm -hmm. 2020. Not, not so, so distant future. 
Right. Uh, and you're back. You're finally back. Bradwick is, uh, David Bradwick is back for the 2020 uh, big festival. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so this already. What will what what uh, does the, the the games the video games uh, uh, environment looks like in 2020? Well, uh, I don't think it's going to change radically from where it is right now. I, I mean, I can't predict what kind of technologies are going to come down that are going to change everything. But some, some of them you already know. It's some um, uh, HoloLens and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I'm Oculus. skeptical about you're, you're VR. skeptical about I am. virtual reality? Look, I don't want to wear a dumb mask on my face. I think it's just weird. I'm not going to sit on my couch and plug out the universe and stick a thing on my face. I think it's just kind of, it's, a, it's an amazing experience that's when you're Because you don't live in Sao Paulo. If you live in Sao Paulo, that's all that you want to do. <laughs> uh, but I, I just think that, you know, it, I, I can't imagine that that is going to be a mass audience kind of device. Until you can actually, you don't have to wear goggles and things like that. I think that then... I think of a mass device with a big audience. You want to make games where you have the potential to reach millions of people. Uh, you know, I, I, it, you know, a mass device is something like a phone. Like, I always think of, this is maybe insulting, but what would my mom use, right? Can she use a cell phone, an iPhone? Yes, she can. Okay, then that's going to be a mass market device. Will my mom sit on the couch and wear the VR set on her face? No. Uh, hell, I won't even do it. There's no way my mom's doing it. So, the, so you know, I think that to have a mass audience device, you have, it has to be simple enough for a mass audience to actually use it. And, uh, and so I don't know if it'll be very radically different than it is right now in five years. I think that only time will tell. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the VR set headsets really do take on and because they are a pretty incredible experience if you've ever used one. Uh, but I just don't see myself as it's too much effort really to do all that rather than there are some big problems with VR sickness and things like that that you experience when you're playing it and uh, and so getting over those humps is not trivial and uh, I think that we've all been promised you know real AI and real robots and flying cars and all sorts of stuff for years uh, and I'll believe it when I see it you know I think phones are the same way people were making cell phones for a long time but then when Apple came out and made New technology comes out of nowhere most of the time, and that's Apple came out and they sh showed off their smartphone. And everybody's like, "Oh, that's the thing there. That's where we're going. It's right there." Everybody knew instantly that this was the game changer, right? And uh, and that's the kind of thing that I think is going to happen. Something's going to come out with a VR headset, and they're going to hear or some kind of virtual reality device, and you're going to go, "Oh, there! That somebody showed us the right way to do that." And I, I just don't think it's there yet. You play a lot of I video do. games every day. I do. And you play with your wife. I do. <laughs> How do you find a wife that likes video games? <laughs> my, my wife doesn't like video games at all. Thanks a lot, David Graham.